And we're live. It is Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020, 5 o'clock p.m. And um, I want to say that the world's dumbest policy thing happened yesterday. Um, I didn't think policy could get dumber, but it did. And of course, it happened in a presidential tweet. It collided two of my worlds, one of which involves Kate, the other of which it does not involve, excuse me, does not involve Kate, it involves a different part of lawfare, the part where we think about and every year dissect the National Defense Authorization Act, otherwise known as the NDAA. Congress, however dysfunctional it gets, never fails to pass the NDAA. Why that's the only thing, however dysfunctional Congress gets, it never fails to do. I'm not really sure. It's kind of interesting. The Armed Services Committees actually manage to pass an NDAA every year for 60 years in a row. Doesn't matter how bad it gets until yesterday. Because the president tweeted that he was going to veto the NDAA unless it contained a full repeal of Section 230. Now, what, I know what you're asking, you're asking, what does Section 230 have to do with the NDAA, which is, after all, the Authorization Act for military activities? And the answer is nothing. It's extortion. The Armed Services <laughs> Committees have no jurisdiction over Section 230. They have no, uh, um, but the president put it in a tweet um, and I think we may have uh, the end of a 60 year streak of passing NDs AA, NDs AA um, uh, because of this. We may not, of course, because he, what can be tweeted can be untweeted right away, but we may not have an NDAA this year because of Kate Klonick. Um, there you go. It's all your fault. <laughs> we are that took a <laughs> turn. <laughs> I knew I could get your attention somehow. <laughs> we are not allowed to have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, we have the frickin' next best thing, which is one of my Twitter idols. And you know, they say like, who are your uh, uh, who are your Twitter crushes? One of mine is Sarah Bond because she tweets the best classical archaeology stuff, Roman history stuff. Um, uh, and the other day she tweeted a bunch of ancient Aramaic manuscripts that are older than I knew ancient Aramaic manuscripts ever were. And uh, we got into an exchange about where, how old ancient Aramaic manuscripts get. Turns out they get way older than I understood. She referred me to the Brooklyn Museum on the subject. I'm really looking forward to the end of COVID so I can go to the Brooklyn Museum. And I thought it is time to have Sarah Bond on in lieu of fun, among other things, because she is the author of, or the translator of the text on both the Lawfare Challenge coin where it says, uh, from the depths of the deep state, uh, 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 where it says a, a, an oasis of uh, knowledge in a sea of banality, and on the uh, baby cannon challenge coin, which says the word boom in Latin, which caused Sarah Bond a great deal of anxiety how to translate the word boom. Uh, we, she finally came up with fragor. Sarah Bond, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I would have my challenge coins here, but they are in my office, which I am not currently in, as you can see. Uh, but at the University of Iowa in the History Department, it is prominently displayed next to my Lego figurines. So very much a position of honor. And uh, so I'm, I'm really honored to be here as well. This is great. I want to start with an awesome phrase in your bio which says that you have a specialty in late antique law, mm -hmm. which um, reminds me of the first line of uh, Ozymandias, I met a traveler from an antique land. And so my question is, what is antique law as distinct from just old law or old as shit law? 
And what is late antique law specifically? What a good question, Ben. I've been there wondering about it all day. Periods. Yeah, there are all these periods that historians basically have subjected on the past. So we have uh, a, a lot of different eras of law. Classical law is probably the one that's most familiar to people who know Roman law. Uh, so classical law um, really encompasses the entirety of Roman law. And I specialize particularly in the period of late antiquity. So that's about 200 CE um, to 800 CE. So let's say 200 years after the death of Christ, all the way up to Charlemagne on Christmas. So once we get to Charlemagne, I tag out. Um, that, that's just not my specialty afterwards. But I focus in on this period that many people might call the fall of the Roman Empire, or the barbarians coming into the empire, as Victor Davis Hanson, of course, would tell us. So um, that, that is late antiquity is, is just this period when Roman law is much more mature and getting into more codification. And uh, because I wanted a visual for you guys, I brought my Theodosian code with this, me. This is going to make my friend Janine very excited. I think she's watching us now. Quite and... large with me here. So I was going to make a Hamilton joke about dear Theodosia, but like I feel like no, no one. Okay, anyway. <laughs> All right. So I want to ask about. I want to ask about this because like one of the things that is so interesting about Roman law is how much of it we know, which is not true of the Greeks. Um, it's not true of the Persians. It is true of the Jews. We have a boatload of, of Jewish law from even before late antiquity. But why do we have all this Roman law? Like, I know why we have the Jewish law, because it's still, these are sacred texts to this day. They've been preserved by a continuous rabbinic establishment for 2,000 years. Why do we have these Roman law, this, this incredible fabric of Roman law? There are a lot of different sources. And so the first, the earliest laws that we have, actually, it's a compilation that have been kind of cobbled together from later references called the Laws of the Twelve Tables. So the Romans don't have a constitution. You know, we have a constitution that we can always refer to and literalists can go back to and say, this is the letter of the law. This is what America was founded upon. We have early laws in Roman law, um, but there's not one constitution that it adheres to or a bill of rights. Um, but the laws of the 12 tables that are from the 5th century BCE, so um, about 300 years after Rome was founded, because Rome was founded as a monarchy in 753 BCE. Romulus is the first king, then there are seven kings, and the last one gets killed off by a guy named Brutus, who is the descendant of the later Brutus um, that kills, well, one of the many. Caesar, right? People. Exactly. Okay, I'm still, I'm hanging in there. <laughs> exactly. So uh, a, a few years, a few decades after we had the establishment of the re Republic, which we call the race publica, the public thing, um, in 509 BCE, we have the laws of the 12 tables. And we're told that these are inscribed in bronze. So one reason that we have Roman laws, just one of them, is that they were very good at picking out bronze and putting them in, on public display. And we have a number of bronze laws that actually survive today, not just from Rome, which we have many of, but from places like modern day Spain and Gaul. So many of the laws that were created by the Romans were inscribed on bronze and disseminated throughout the entirety of the empire. So it's duplicating on a very, very um, durable material like bronze. Um, is, is something that's very helpful. But the other thing that is probably the most important um, is that we have compilations of laws in the late Roman period, in late antiquity, particularly that are driven by Theodosius II, who is a Roman emperor, and by Justinian. Theodosius II is early 5th century, and then we have Justinian in the early 6th century, and both of them are obsessed with taxonomies and law and creation of order through making codices that project their power. 
right? So this idea that if you compile law together and you have all the laws under your name, it creates a majesty and a legitimacy for your reign um, that other people will, will perhaps adhere to. Um, so we have these compilations in the late Roman period, but we also have archeology. span so all of these together um, combined is why we have a lot of Roman laws, plus those that are cited within literary sources. So when you're reading about a law in Cicero, we can extrapolate it out of Cicero and say, oh, 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 he's talking about this law that was passed by Caesar, right? So we have little references that are in literature as well. All of this together is what Roman legal experts look at in order to figure out what the hell was going on. And how complete do we understand it to be? I mean, you could have a lot of US law and still not even, you know, crack, you know, the US code, right? Mm -hmm. when, when you hold up that very substantial Theodosian code book, how much of what percent of Roman law at the time of Theodosius is that? That's a good question. One thing I want to kind of start with as a question for you guys is, does having laws allow us to extrapolate a social reality? Like if I have a law code, can I really reconstruct Roman history and Roman society from it? Because it says that I'm not supposed to jaywalk and I jaywalk every single day. So can you say that just because we have law codes from Roman society, that that was the social reality that they actually live within, or were laws just being used as a rhetoric of power? Yeah, I mean, so I would say, and I was actually thinking about you saying this, and I was taking, I would decided to, to like, just kind of listen and take notes for a second, because it kind of what you're saying is jiving with a recent kind of like theory that I've been tossing around in my own research, which is kind of like the, like an intuitive concept of the law and how an intuitive concept of the law from yourself, from your own perspective fits in with this, like the modern empirical social psychology kind of framework. And then also kind of a, a very to, to like archeological or kind of sociological framework. Um, so, I think you were kind of going here, or maybe this is where you ended, but like, can we talk more about like what it meant to codify law, what it meant to put it into bronze? Because that is super interesting to me because it's one, obviously, and probably foremost, a formalist distinction. And then secondly, it is like in that age, a way to disseminate the information, which was not there before. But then like there's this one extra part of something being cast in bronze that we we don't have when something is like written like post printing press and everything which is the difficulty in changing it and the difficulty in like kind of rewriting the bronze right and updating it and so can you talk about what like writing things in bronze versus like having a paper press did to the law sure there are a couple of things to, to say first off, is that Romans are most concerned with civil law, that criminal law is uh, are essentially offenses towards the state that damage the state. So let's say questioning elections, that would be a criminal offense. Um, or uh, say sedition, treason, because that's an offense that you commit against the state. About 95% of what we have of Roman law are civil offenses. And that's predominantly what we have, for instance, in the Corpus Juris Civilis, which is Justinian's corpus of, uh, of civil law. So first of all, a lot of this is civil rather than criminal, even though there are some distinctions to make between how Romans uh, classify that and then, and then how we do today. When we look at the bronze, I think something that we have to keep in mind before we talk about that is that the literacy rate in the ancient world is probably according to Mary Beard and many other people studying literacy in the ancient world, 10 to 15%, okay? So we've got the presentation of Roman law um, and also probably a reliance on somebody else to read it for you or just knowledge that that's something that is said in the forum where a lot of law is set up within the forum Romanum. So 
you have things on Bronze Law, but probably only 10 to 15% of people are able to read it in Latin. Um, and then we have laws in other provinces that may be written in Greek, for instance, um, depending on, on where it is, is set up. So we have these bronze laws, but you're right, it's very difficult to change them in any way. So only certain laws get put up in bronze. And then we have certain edicts that are on a yearly basis. So magistrates, such as the praetor, and the praetor is the person that is kind of the head judiciary within the city of Rome. He puts out an edict every year that says who can come before the praetor's court in order to be heard. So for instance, my book looks at the fact that certain professions like prostitutes, gladiators, disreputable people can't come before the praetor, right? And so they can't even have these cases that we call actiones that come before the law courts. So we have these yearly edicts, we have bronze, we have juristic opinions, which are basically the top juristic minds of the time who put out various opinions every year. And then we have the law codices who oftentimes take those top juristic opinions and write them down. But yeah, they're, they're just, it's coming from so many different places that it's very different than American law, I, I think in, in many ways because there's less centralization. So I'm yeah. interested in the Roman relationship with law which seems to me to be, um, I, I find it one of the hardest aspects of Rome to access emotionally and intellectually. On the one hand- Wait, hold on, I missed you, Ben. What did you say? Which aspect of, which the, era? Which is the Roman relationship with mm. law. And I'm, I'm hoping that my voice is coming through a little bit better now. Um, but, you know, on the one hand, this is a highly legalistic society. Um, and from relatively early, even before we have, at, you know, even when Roman history is just shrouded in myth and the king's eras, we have this, these institutions that are weirdly legalistic that develop. You have layered offices of a, of a type that is, you know, you have a weird constitutional system in which you have essentially elections for consul, dual consul. You have the additional layer of the dictator on top of that. And then you have all of this. I mean, you have a weird constitutional law fabric uh, and they seem to take it really seriously. Um to the point that a huge amount of modern law retains its language, it retains its assumptions, um, and particularly in civil law societies, it's directly influential. Um, on the other hand, this is one of the raw power societies of all time, marches into places and just subjugates them, does mm. not feel constrained in any way that I can tell by its own law in its actions with respect to uh, power. Um, and they do such a bad job regulating power that they are the negative model for, you know, they're jokingly for Machiavelli, really seriously for our founders, all their reference points are how badly the Romans did. And so my question is, what did the word, what did the word law mean to a Roman? Yeah, in Latin, it's use, I-U-S is, is how we translate law. But there are lots of unspoken laws as well as spoken ones. And so there are social mores that Romans very much adhere to. And then there's written laws as well. So a lot of the orality of Roman culture gets lost sometimes when we're trying to look at specifically just law codes in order to reconstruct what society was like. Um, but I think a good example here is to go back to Julius Caesar and the crossing of the Rubicon, because I think it holds a lot of parallels with what we're looking at with Trump today, right? So one big thing about Trump trying to stay with this and trying to 
continue this farce that he actually won the election is that he wants the protection of being a magistrate. And this goes all the way back to antiquity because in ancient Rome, if you have the power of imperium, that is to say you have the power where we get the word empire from or imperator, um, he, if you have the rule over, uh, over an army as Julius Caesar did when he was in Gaul, um, then you cannot be prosecuted in court. And so he is adhering to the law by standing in front of the Rubicon because that is the farthest south that his province goes. His power only reaches to that river. And so what he knows is that once he crosses over all of the debts, all of the crimes and all of the things that he's done wrong, he is going to be held accountable for as soon as he gives up Imperium, which is what happens when he crosses the Rubicon, right? And and that's the same thing that Trump is, is doing now. So. Romans at once have a very distilled knowledge of law, especially elite men um, have a, a knowledge of law because we have a, a very much a regularization of the courts and outdoor courts everywhere, all over in between stoas um, and in the forum all the time. But at the same time, we have in the late Republic into the empire, a knowledge also by leaders of how to transgress that. So I think it's a knowledge of the law and a respect for the elders. At the same time, we see in the late Republic and early empire, more and more willingness to transgress those laws and then to create propaganda that obfuscates the fact that you have transgressed it. So Julius Caesar, to me, um, is very much the embodiment of that, is that he had been very much an advocate in courts. He had served as an edile. He had served as a consul. He had been um, already a governor in Gaul. And here he knows that he has to give up his province if he crosses over the Rubicon. But he also knows that he owes a lot of people money. And he knows that he has committed a lot of crimes. And he does not want to be held accountable. And that's why he asks to stand in absentia. And they say, a no. You have to be in Rome. <laughs> you have to be in Rome to run for uh, for another in order to run for consul. Um, and uh, he's like, well, I can't go to Rome because then I'd have to give up my power and people would attack me. And that's what Trump is feeling right now, I think. Yeah. All right. So you crossed this Rubicon, <laughs> not I. Um, you okay, yeah. you brought up the comparison between Trump's America and the late Republic. Um Everybody, like, among the comparisons for America in this era, we get Weimar and we get the late Republic. Weimar, different conversation. Um, how, how should we, you know, are, is Trump reasonably comparable to, but for skill set and accomplishments, to the Gracchi or to Marius um or and 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 to what extent is the late republic a good metaphor for modern america or is it just something we reach for because you can always say in the late republic and assume that if you're not talking to sarah bond person won't be conversant enough with roman history to correct you it's that last one i, I mean i i <laughs> I hate every article that's like, is Trump the new Nero, right? Or <laughs> is is Trump Caligula? Is he Julius? We're reading different things. <laughs> it's, it's so many different. I, I don't know. I think it's because people run out of op-eds to write. And so normally it's like, are we Rome? Which is Colin Murphy's book, who used to be the editor for The Atlantic. Um, and it's an interesting, intriguing question, but I think part of that is because we want to be Rome. That this idea that if we compare ourselves to Rome, it creates a parallel and a relationship that we desperately want. Um, Why? To, Why do you think that? Why do you think we want to be Rome? Uh, because I think that there is this feeling that they were mighty and that they were the greatest civilization within Western civilization. And I put that in quotation marks because that's uh, something that, that is very much a dog whistle for white supremacy when we say Western civilization. And I'm here in Iowa 
And people like Steve King, who's on his way out, use ideas of neoclassical architecture, which Trump also loves, um, uses uh, these ideas of Western civilization and Roman law as a way of justifying a thread between current Midwestern Iowans and Americans um, and ancient Rome as a society that we have to maintain our connection to. And so uh, I think part of the parallels are that we want to see ourselves in ancient Rome, uh, but I don't think that it does any good for us to say Trump is the new Caesar. He certainly isn't the Gracchi, because I believe that the Gracchi um, are, should be lauded on a much higher level. Maybe Tiberius more than Gaius, but definitely Cornelia, their mom. Okay, I'm gonna stand by that. But um, I, I don't think that it does a lot of good for, for people to write in The Economist about Trump being Caesar. What about Trump being mm -hmm. um, uh, the Kool Aid but, Man? Well, sorry. So, <laughs> what about at one, one level removed, saying, you know, there was an elaborate constitutional arrangement? Uh, a group of people purporting, granted the populism, the populare, in, had real grievances that like, are a lot more obviously legit to me than the, uh, than the Trumpists, but they're, they're both populists in some sense. Um, uh, and this combined with a, a corrosive, uh, uh, corruption uh, that caused the kind of degradation of these uh, elaborated constitutional uh, systems until there was enough rot that, uh, you know, first Caesar and then ultimately Augustus just kind of chopped through them. Uh, what about that level of the metaphor? Well, I do think that there is a degradation right now of traditional systems of power, that we're seeing the executive um, use pardons and use executive orders in a way that um, I have not seen in my lifetime, certainly. And so this, this really is an increase in executive power that may be able to be paralleled with the late republic. So you mentioned um, Marius, and I think Marius very much depended on a lot of military might whereas Sulla was a little bit smarter because he actually proposes his new constitution and then steps away as dictator. He steps in as a dictator and then he actually retires. Um, and, he, uh, and he leaves it over to Pompey and Crassus, who then rise up afterwards. So, um, but I think that you're, that you're right, that there is a little bit of parallel with the traditional structures of power breaking down and, and kind of the checks and balances that normally have been there. Because in the Republic, uh, the Senate had had a lot of power over foreign money and also um, over the, the control of the provinces and especially gubernatorial positions that came out of the Senate. So we're starting to see that the consulship is degrading, that magistracies are degrading, that you're not supposed to hold magistracies like the consulship um, in a row. And suddenly people are holding like five or six in a row like Marius does, right? And, and so, yeah, the, the, I, I would say that what they would call the mas maiorum, the way of the ancestors, is getting broken down. Uh, and, that, and I think that's happening right now, too. But in part, um, I, I hate the fact that everybody has to bring up fake news, but misinformation is a huge part of the late Republic at the same time as we're living in right now. So you brought in the populares, the populists we call, or the optimates, which are the optimates, the best men, right? That is to say the patricians and the, and the kind of very rich people, um, their aristocratic people versus the populares and, and the populist politics. And so we have lots of misinformation that is being sent out within the city of Rome as to who is good and who is bad. You know, are you team Cicero? Or are you going to be team Clodius? Um, these, these are all people kind of in, in the late, or Cicero versus Antony, very famously, because Antony hates Cicero and has him killed, has his hands and his head put on a pike. So, I, I mean, you know, we have a lot of misinformation being spread, uh, and particularly by Octavian and by Lepidus and by Antony in the Second Triumvirate. 
So yeah, I, I would say breaking down and misinformation are, are two big themes in both. So you're not opposed to any comparison between the de- regimes in decay and some of their uh, qualities in common. You're merely uh, resistant to the direct attribution of Trump to any specific Roman character. Exactly. I so think here's, yeah, systemic. go ahead. It's, we can look at systemic trends and see that um, these are long durée systemic trends for, for various um, cultures, but to say he's one person is so difficult, right? And also we are talking uh, about um, just a different time and context. So I I just don't think that does a a lot of, it's not very helpful. So what you just mentioned is like a different time and context is exactly what anyone should think about when they make a comparison to like classical times, I would think. Yet people like really love to draw and like, sorry, everyone on the show already knows, but you don't, like I, that I've studied this cognitive science and similarity judgment and things like that. People love to draw similarity and analogy between things. And if they can draw kind of even like very base, but like just t- topical kind of similarities between like moments in history or whatever, they'll be like, oh, like history is repeating itself. But we all know that like history doesn't actually repeat itself. No one actually thinks that the entire earth is spinning and just like the characters are like shuffling in and out, right? Like, I, at least I hope no one thinks that. Um, but kind of what I want to ask you is like, when you find yourself in most of the conversations that you've had over the last four years, are they a is there been in the last couple of years of your scholarship a pushback against a very specific group of people that have tried to misuse this history or to kind of like they're not saying anything wrong they're just kind of like using it and implying from it wrong yeah i i think that white supremacists have very much co-opted and hi hello Hello. Co-opted and, and used uh, a lot of different parts of Roman society as a way of symbolizing their connection to the past. So, if we look at Charlottesville and the Unite the Right protest, um, we have, for instance, the Fosses that is on the shields of the Unite the Right protesters. Um, so, we have a, a, the Fosses is a symbol of Roman magistrates that they are allowed to inflict corporal punishment on people. It has an axe in it. As um, if you're outside the city of Rome, you can have a double-headed axe called a fossi. Um, and the lictors who follow a magistrate around can use it to beat even citizens, right? Um, and so we see the fossi suddenly showing up on T-shirts, on shields, on white supremacists, paraphernalia. Um, and, and I think that a lot of the use of symbols and aesthetics, maybe not the words, but the aesthetics of antiquity uh, have become very much a part of the, the popular zeitgeist at the moment in the same way that Molan Labe has become uh, something of a calling card for those as a part of the Second Amendment, or if you're Ted Cruz, something that is to refer to Turkey. And and the the fascia is is a very interesting example because that's the that's the word that fascist the the root that the word fascist comes from is is literally that bundle. Oh, I didn't I didn't realize that. No, that that's that, that's sense. the root of the word, and the um, I should have like put that together. And and Mussolini, uh, the name the fascist party came from uh, the the willingness to hold those bundles of of their like bundles of sticks right yeah. with which you can beat people exactly oh, sorry. you're muted ada sorry oh Are there you no you're not muted now Hi, you're not ada. muted okay it's a bundle of sticks with an axe in the middle uh, yeah. this is actually a fun subject of very tricky debate right now in the city of chicago because of the balbo monument uh so this is a great example of the reuse of this material this is a carved stone block from the Roman port city of Ostia that has Fasces carved on the outside of it. That was given to the city of Chicago by Mussolini as a gift recognizing the friendship between <laughs> Chicago and Mussolini. Yeah, Mussolini was in power <laughs> a long time. <laughs> and, you know, you, so there's Reminds this strange debate, like, 
<laughs> right. We don't want to have this up because it's celebrating Mussolini, but we don't want to destroy it because it's a real Roman antiquity. How do you reframe mm -hmm. it? Where do you put it? Can it be transformed into something that undermines and attacks the negative things that it symbolized? And this is one of these fascinating, how do we repurpose and overturn our You know, the same stuff? year, the... Don't, I don't want to say this too loudly because people will, will, will notice. And um, the same year that uh, Japan uh, incorporated Korea into uh, the empire uh, and actually annexed it, I believe it was 1910, uh, was the year the emperor of Japan gifted to the city of Washington the cherry trees that now line the um, symbol the of basement. friendship. You know, and people, uh, only one of the original trees still survives. But, um, yeah, there are a lot of fascist gifts to American, um, uh, uh, to American cities. Um, Kate Freedom Prize, man. Sorry. Um, I'm just really happy to have Ada here. I, like, pinged her, Hello. and she was super <laughs> excited to hear that Sarah's on the show. Ada has been on the show. Ada Palmer is a renaissance historian at the university of chicago a professor um she's also an author of some of my favorite um science fiction books um the terra ignota series uh which i would highly highly recommend especially in times of pandemic they are mostly optimistic and incredibly enlightening and so they're wonderful and um anyway she was just stopping by to say hello to sarah and Hi. to join our discussion about uh, everything ancient and antique and law. Um, and so I guess I was going to kind of pose to both of you. Um, I'm actually kind of a little bit curious about this bundle of an ax wrapped in wood. Like, I don't understand. Why do you wrap it in wood? Why do you just not take out the ax? Like, what is the point there? Is it like a present to be like, here, you can chop down a tree. And also when you do some bonus kindling, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I put my article in the chat so people can see. I wrote an article for Hyperallergic about the Fosses and the, the history of its reuse. But so the bundle of sticks indicates to people that the lictors can be even citizens. Because if you think back to the Bible, um, we know that Paul was a citizen, right? Paul was a, a citizen who was not supposed to ever be beaten. Um, and so when he is being beaten, he says, uh, well, in Jerome's translation, he says, um, Kibis Romana Sum, I am a Roman citizen. And that means they have to stop beating them, right? But if a magistrate has lictors and has the power of Imperium with the Fosses, he can beat whomever he wants. Within the area of um, Rome, you are not supposed to have an ax within it. And then outside the Palmarium, which is like a sacred boundary line in Rome, you are allowed to put the two-headed ax. And it's really a symbol of threatening violence. Right. So the wooden sticks are sticks to beat somebody with. Right. Yeah. And it's a bundle of sticks to beat somebody with, with an ax in the middle to execute somebody with. Yeah. Representing your authority to inflict corporal punishment, lethal and non-lethal. Yeah. Um, it's it's comparable to the imagery of how in medieval and Renaissance art, the personifications of the seven liberal arts have different things that they carry. And the personification of grammar carries a stick for beating students with, because that's what <laughs> teaching grammar is like in the Middle Ages. They literally and, should and, have And still, if done me. properly. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the pedagogy in, in ancient Rome that we really get pedagogues from, they also are very into corporal punishment, but so are monks. Monks like to beat people with sticks as well. So sticks are a big symbol in ancient Rome of the ability to beat down because you're only supposed to really beat up people of lower status without corporal mm -hmm. protection over their body, right? So the, the, the problem with Paul being beaten is that citizens are supposed to never be physically touched Right. And, and I think about this a lot when we talk about George Floyd, when we think about um, the entirety of police violence within America, is that citizens are supposed to be protected from corporal violence in ancient Rome and today. And yet we have the state interfering in order um, to to really hurt other people in a way that the law says they should not. But hmm. so this is very interesting, though, because I think the Romans had a in addition to a very complicated relationship with the idea of law, 
they had a very, very fierce concept of citizenry, which is quite different from a sort of modern cosmopolitan idea of citizenry. Yeah, I mean, in the extreme case, you have Ada's world where, you know, you can be a citizen of wherever you choose, but you kind of live wherever and you commute by flying car. That's the extreme version of something that we're actually living, except during lockdown, which is, you know, yeah, I'm a U.S. citizen, but I, I go to meetings in the EU and I, you know, maybe in Korea. And um, this is a very this is a very modern idea of what it means to be a citizen. When Paul says, you can't beat me, I'm a citizen, he's invoking something else. Right? Privilege. Yeah. What is it? What The Roman conception of citizen incorporates what and excludes what? That's a good question and it changes over time. Actually, the leading scholar on this is at Ada's institution. His name is Clifford Ando. Um, mm -hmm. He is one of the leading scholars in, in Roman law in the world, really. And he's written a whole book on citizenship. And one of the big points that he points out of change um, is the year 212. The year 212 is when the Edict of Caracalla, as we call it, or the Constitutio Antoniniana, if you want to feel very fancy, it gives citizenship to everybody within the Roman Empire. But prior to 212, right, um, we have citizenship doled out in little itty bits. So it starts with the city of Rome, and then after the social wars, it goes to Italy. And then after Italy, it goes into areas like Gaul under Claudius, right? Or we have areas of Britannia and areas of Spain. But we still have very few people actually getting it, right? It's very much something mm -hmm. that's elite. So after the year 212, it's no longer an elite status symbol to be called a citizen. Um, and so we have then a new status symbol, because if everybody has it, if everybody has a Prada bag, why do I want a Prada bag, right? What, what is the status symbol about that? And so after 212, there are other types of status symbols that people have um, called humiliores and honestiores that are different strata within the social hierarchy, because Romans are very in the hierarchy, just like we are. Um, very, very socially stratified, as people like Walter Scheidel at Stanford has, has pointed out. And the, the expansion of citizenship was a strategic way of getting newly conquered mm -hmm. elites to switch sides in effect, right? Because once mm -hmm. you extend to the local elites of a place you just conquered, now they're citizens and they get the benefits of citizenship and they get the protection of the law and they get to get rich if they help Rome conquer more stuff you turn what would be the leaders of local resistance into people who have now been shared, received a shared privilege and then want to entrench that privilege and keep it. So it's a very strategic step-by-step -step expansion in those earlier phases from city of Rome to leaders in you know the regions of Italy to other particular regions. When you let people in Gaul have citizenship, they help you fight the Germans, that kind of thing. Um, which then step by step expands over time. It's a tactic of imperialism, Ada, and I think that's yeah. exactly correct. It's so brilliant. It's so brilliant. It also kind of helps me make sense of like the the U.S. like exceptionalist concept of citizenship, which is different than everything that you've just described. I think even keeping in mind like free states and slave states and like the eventual kind of citizens citizenry of like, I feel like, like there just was never that preciousness around citizenship um, in the, in like in the U S it was just a matter of like culture and economics. Does that can make I, sense? Can I add something about how you get citizenship that I didn't really explain, but it's, I think, very important about American military systems versus our military systems is that when you serve 20 to 25 years in the Roman military, you get something called a diploma, right? It's a bronze diploma that gives you citizenship. Um, and that's something that soldiers would work their whole lives for. Um, and we've seen in the past, five to six years, and especially in the Trump administration, this degradation of this idea that 
if you serve in the American military, you will become a citizen. This extension of citizenship rights to um, those individuals that aren't American, but if they serve in the military, then they will become citizens. Trump has cut down on this um, in, in drastic ways that are devastating. And I should say that Romans always abided by the fact that if you served in the military and you served your time, you became a citizen at the end and you got the power to marry who you wanted. And you also uh, got various other rights connected uh, to your veteran status. And what was the, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, what was the, um, the, the, the internal discussion justifying that? Was it a sense of social contract? Was it a sense of we have to incentivize people to serve for long periods of time? Was it a sense of moral obligation? How did they talk to themselves about that? Well, Augustus extends it. It had previously, there were 10 to 15 years in the Republic that you had to serve. First of all, you have to live 20 or 25 years. That's tough, okay? As a, I, I'm talking about normally you go in the age of like 18 or so. So that means that you're serving a long period of time. So first of all, you have to live to be a veteran after 20 to 25 years. But Augustus says, I'm gonna increase the pay to centurions. I'm gonna increase the pay to the soldiers. And he shifts an allegiance not just to the Republic, but to the princeps, to the first man who is mm -hmm. a vessel, right? So he's strategically making it so that the soldiers are looking more towards the princeps than the Senate or to any other general that may be directing them. And so this is really part of the brilliance of Augustus that Mussolini is going to try and imitate when he resettles the Republic um, in fascist Italy, is that he wants to be the new Augustus and the new Principate. Um, and part of that is getting the soldiers to have an allegiance and a loyalty to an individual rather than to a republic. In the same way that, I'm sorry, I know I bring him up and you guys aren't, but like Trump wants the allegiance of the military to be individual to him, but the oath is to the entirety of the republic. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we really see with Octavian that he's brilliant at. And when Septimius Severus dies 200 years later, his last words are remember to pay the soldiers. Right. Because you do not want to get killed. Um, so things in that 200 year period really change. I'd like to jump back briefly. Actually, we should introduce two people, but to two things that Sarah touched on, which were codification of law and the question of legitimacy. Because, um, you know, my period, which comes later, right, we have late antique and then we have long aftermath. You know, the, as, as she expressed, these, you know, legendary bronze tablets that have the law inscribed on them were never the whole law. They were never fully completed. There was always complications and layers, but the idea that they existed you know, texts describing them, the idea that there had been this perfect, excellently codified set of laws inscribed forever uh, in a temple and everyone could go see them, became a powerful idea in the imaginations of later peoples. It became one of the things that you would try to do or claim to establish legitimacy and also that you would deny in others to establish their illegitimacy. So it moves to Roman law becoming the beginning of the idea that if you have a written book of law, no matter how incomplete and incoherent it is, it makes your civilization more legitimate than other civilizations. And it's one of the tools that civilizations are able to use to accuse others of barbarism. Huh. Uh, so to crib a, a bit from Eddie Izzard, where he talks about imperialism, right? You have the imperialist landing on the land and saying, I claim this land for Spain or whatever. Well, they and have the a flag. There is like, flag. We have already, right. And he says, do you have a flag? We have a flag. If you don't have a flag, there's no country, no flag, no country, right? It's the idea of no book, no law, right? No code, no law. And so even if the Icelanders have a law speaker who has memorized the body of law and can recite it verbatim at the all thing incredibly impressively every alternate year, that doesn't count because it's not written down the way the Romans did. Not, even, so if, becomes, not even if the continental shelf goes <laughs> right through where he's speaking and, and it and, divides the unpronounceable <laughs> name of the, of the canyon. Yes. 
Indeed, not even then. And so it becomes one of many things like having a flag, like having a coat of arms, like having noble ancestry that you can invoke in order to legitimize your regime and illegitimize whatever other regimes you're trying to compare yourself to. Uh, and this is how the Justinian Code and other Roman law codes come to be used all over the place so that there was a divorce case in California a few decades ago that was settled by Roman law because it's technically still in place in any part of the Americas that used to belong to Spain or Portugal uh, by an old treaty. And so you could invoke these things forever and ever. And just like putting an eagle on your anything, it projects legitimacy. Um, so now we're gonna go to questions. Uh, this was awesome. Also because you don't know this, Ada, but I play that Eddie Izzard clip in my <laughs> <laughs> in my property in my property class when we talk about like the subject matter of property and before we do Mac Macintosh, which is the right. case where like the US just comes in and like takes all of this land from indigenous tribes. Um, but anyways, and that is relevant because um, one of my former students has uh, the first question. Uh, so go ahead, Genevieve, uh, ask your Hi. question. Can you hear me? Yep. Indeed. Okay, so I'm gonna slightly change it just very quickly. You have um, two questions in there and you should ask them both, but change really? them as you like. Yeah. Okay. So the, f the question there is really, since there are some analogs of a reliance on norms in ancient Rome and the US, are there any areas of law in our modern law that you think there should be more codification or any areas that there should be less? That's a good question. What's the other question? Oh, who's your favorite Roman emperor and who is your favorite <laughs> ancient woman? There you go. This is, I, I'll, I'll be interested to hear Ada's as well. I, I'll go with the second one and then we can we can go back to the more complex one in a second. So my favorite Roman emperor is Diocletian. Um, he establishes the Tetrarchy, but he also disseminates a law called the Price Edict. And the price edict is a maximum prices edict. And so he's trying to address hyperinflation within the empire during the course of the third century. So it's a 301 law. It's my favorite law. Um, besides a, a law that we haven't talked about yet about Romans having to wear pants in the city of Rome. Um, but Diocletian is my favorite. And, uh, and even though he killed a lot of Christians, many apologies. Um, and I love, uh, in, in terms of women, Julia Domna. Julia Domna is part of the Severian lineup of women. She's a Syrian empress who, who is part of uh, these women who married African emperors. And um, I love Julia Domna because she has badass hair and she's a badass woman. Um, and now can uh, I get a little bit of oh, the first question? Can I, uh, can you guys? Yeah, let's just get, let's just get Ada's answer to the, to the second question. Then we'll both, okay. and then we'll go back to you for first question. The second question being favorite emperors and favorite Woman. Um, uh, favorite woman is Perict no, well, in antiquity, is Perictione, which is Plato's mother, who we believe was a Pythagorean philosopher and related to the people who had tried to make Pythagorean philosophical cities in Italy. That is what the Republic is based on, but she gets written out of histories of Plato's life because 19th century people thought it wasn't plausible that a woman could be a philosopher. Uh, uh, but she seems to have been really cool. Uh, and I, my favorite emperors vary a lot, uh, but uh, currently I'm into Vitellius because I'm interested in how awesome a narration of his life would be because he was you know, a, a mediumly disliked Roman aristocrat who then becomes Tiberius as organizer of orgies and then is a favorite of Caligula, then gets banished under Claudius, and then eventually gets to be emperor for like a week. Uh, and I can't believe there isn't a scandalous nudity-filled Showtime series about him already, because all the artists are writing just right your, there. Your, your <laughs> treatment of it, and, and yeah, I know. Like, like I, I guarantee they're there. That they like you'll find uh, wanting for that content. Um, so wait, what's your answer to the first question? about like laws that you think should Wait, be codified. Wait, can't I say one thing about Diocletian oh, yes, though? Course. Oh, there okay. is an awesome <laughs> thing about Diocletian as well, which is the great, great, great Handel uh, Oratorio uh, Theodora begins with the announcement that it is Diocletian's natal day. And, uh, and I've always held a special uh, 
a place in my heart because a a bass who can really sing comes starts the uh, the opera or the oratorio by saying, "Tis Diocletian's natal day," and I think that's gotta speak well for him. All right, first uh, question. Okay, can I say one thing about Diocletian that's very interesting? Yeah, he wasn't good to Christians. His palace um, was a set for Game of Thrones where the dragons are kept. It's in Croatia and Split. So if you mm -hmm. ever go to Split, okay, and you get to go to Diocletian's palace, that's where Daenerys Targaryen keeps the dragons. They filmed most of the scenes there. And so also Game of Thrones. Diocletian. And he built it for that reason. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> he knew. Planning. He knew. Planning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's let, let's let, let's address uh, 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 Genevieve's first question uh, before we go to our last two questioners. So go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Norms uh, that you would keep and norms you would get rid of. Or, or, or like norms you would codify and norms that you yeah. would uncodify or like laws that you would uncodify. I would like many more uh, laws and, and codification of who can get pardoned and how and why. I, I got to over the past couple of days, I've been so confused. I've been talking to Andrew Rigsby, who is also a Roman law expert, um, and I was not aware that you could even preemptively pardon. So now that there are all these um, kind of loopholes about, oh, should he pardon his children and how many of them, et cetera, and him. I guess I, I was not aware of all the laws that, that there isn't a lot of control over um, how the executive gives a pardon and who is given out to it. So I would like many more laws explaining that to me um, because I, I don't think that there is there are enough holds on, on pardoning. Um, if I could have a little bit less, I think that uh, there should be many more laws that, that are not surrounding uh, narcotics and drugs in general. Iowa still does not have legalized weed. Um, we're waiting on it, but uh, Ada has it in, in Illinois, and right now it's have it. on a state basis. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. You can I'm get it from our farm share. I'm still so I can't have it yet, and I, I can't have it here legally in Iowa. But yeah, I, I think the delegalization um, of drugs and uh, rolling back of really the Reagan era um, would be really, really nice in a lot of ways. So. How about you, Ada? Great answer. What, what are you into codifying and decodifying? Um, so lately for codifying, our law doesn't do very much to spell out the rights of children and underage people. It spells out the rights of adults to do things to children and underage people, but it doesn't look at it from the perspective of what are the rights that children have. Yep. There are all of these things that let parents keep materials away from people or let community groups feel they should ban X because X is harmful to children. And if there were text specifying here are the rights of minors that cannot be abridged even by parents or that can be abridged by parents but not by, you know, it would be much more helpful for defending the rights of kids in a variety of ways in a lot of branches of law. Such an uh, interesting as, point. It's a great point. Uh, as for decodifying, if you add one sentence to every law, you get a lot of decodifying, which is I'm becoming more and more in favor of putting sunset clauses in everything, where after X amount of time, it has to be passed again or it goes away. Uh, because we have so many old laws, like it's still illegal to not wear a wool hat on Sunday in Maryland. And while nobody enforces this, somebody could, right, if they wanted to use it to harass some minority that they wanted to pick on. Although These things the can ancient, be dragged out. The ancient uh, principle of desuetude uh, would mm. likely prevent enforcement of the wool hat law. Um, you know, so I've been imagining, what if there were an additional body of your parliamentary system, and think of it as an extra branch of Congress, whose job is to repass old legislation, and all old legislation has to come up in front of it. And the older the legislation is, the less often it has to come up. So something fairly recent has to come up once every five years, and they have to confirm, yes, this still makes sense. But like, it means once every 50 years, you re-examine the way the state defines murder. And think about it and see whether it needs to be revised and see whether you want to recommend, hey, we've, because of genetic engineering and cloning, figured out a complicated, weird thing that complexifies our definition of murder. And we should revise it in this way. If there were a body of the 
of the legislature devoted to re-examining old law and recommending either keeping it, getting rid of it, or modifying it. It would make a lot of these things where we're still enforcing copyright on laws that were invented when printing presses were still very exciting. Uh, would get fixed and improved. They would make our law grow with us better. I love that. And I think that's totally smart. There is kind of something like that, Ada. It's like through the restatement, which mm -hmm. is a publication that kind of summarizes all existing law and kind of like provides like a kind of a compilation of like what that where the law is standing at a given time. And that's a group of like kind of elite scholars that like revise that constantly. But it's not official. It's just a, right. it's a secondary source. Well, um, and to look but, at the yeah. acute consequences of this. So when, you know, the U.S. is stuck with the Patriot Act. And it abridges a lots of lots of rights. When Britain passed something quite similar during the Troubles, they passed it with a sunset clause. And then when the Troubles had been eased up for a while, it was able to just go away without any politician having to vote against it and be afraid of their opponents yeah. mocking them for voting against a it. Actually, a lot of if the Patriot, Patriot Act, class has a bunch that. of key provisions it's of easy. the Patriot Act had a sunset clause too. Yeah, and but they were, others didn't. Others did not. Yeah, um, yeah. All right, E.G. Phillips, the floor is yours. Hey, um, as a, <clears throat> somebody who studied the classics in a previous life, um, I find the interest, it's interesting to compare you know, the current situation to the late Roman Republic, although obviously it's imperfect. Um, I think the relationship between the military uh, and the state is one of the primary differences. Um, but you do have things, um, you know, my snarky comment was, are the mean tweets the equivalent of the prescription lists in the forum? But in general, um, you know, you have, you know, the Senate in Rome sort of ceding its power to the print caps. Um, and now we have this situation where Republican senators are more or less willing to just go along with what Trump is doing. Um, and I'm wondering how you, how you see the evolution of that in the late Roman Republic versus what we're seeing now? Well, I, I would say that the prescriptions we should take very seriously, right? Because they're not just mean tweets. When the second, let's talk, I mean, there are prescriptions at various times. Sulla passes prescriptions, of course, um, that kills off a lot of Caesar's uh, relatives. But if we think about the second triumvirate, which is really when major prescriptions happen after Octavian and Lepidus and Antony form their triumvirate, that's 2,000 equestrians and 300 senators. So so about half of the Roman Senate is being killed, along with a large part of the aristocracy, and they're being able to be killed and their property taken, right? And, and also these individuals then have orphans that cannot have status in, in the future. And so um, prescriptions really are extremely intense in, in terms of these are killing people at will, that you then are not going to be um, held for murder. Um, and so Cicero is probably the most famous person killed by the prescriptions in 43 BCE. Um, and Cicero very famously had given the Philippics against the Philippics against Mark Antony. And so um, there were senators standing up, right? Um, at, at, but not many of them. So I think there's a parallel there that many people did uh, kind of kowtow to Julius Caesar, but some of them just weren't able to object because they were dead. Um, so right now we have people staying silent and alive. And, and so last night when I watched the Georgia, um, when, when I watched the, the individual uh, from Georgia who's the head of elections come out and say like there are death threats happening, right? There's violence that is being um, uh, waged against these people. Um, this is something that was very reminiscent of the Republic because it was a violent time where people got hurt and people actually died um, trying to defend the Republic during the Civil Wars. So, um, yeah, I don't want it to get to that point. I don't want it to get to the prescription point for sure. And, you know, I mean, ju just to amplify that point, I mean, Mike Flynn got a pardon the other day and immediately gave a interview this is the former National Security Advisor of the United States, a three-star general, uh, and somebody who um, uh, ran the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, gave an interview suggesting that the president invoke limited martial law 
um, uh, in order to uh, hold, have the military hold a, a new election. Uh, and, you know, so, like, we're not at the stage of prescription yet, but we're not, not at a stage where it's worth thinking about as an interesting analogy, to, you know. I agree. Sorry, Ada, you were, uh, you were about to say something. Well, no, it's just the other, the other very Roman comparison that I think is also valuable here uh, because of the non-hereditary nature of the presidency is papal elections. Because when a family gets in power as Pope, you entrench as fast as you can, you slurp up as much money as you can, you arrange for people to bump off your enemies as much as you can pretend you're not doing. Uh, and then you try to give as much of that money to your nephews and nieces and relatives and friends as you can before your tenure ends and a different family moves into power and you have to have siphoned enough off to protect yourself with that wealth against the rise of the next group. And I think because of the non-hereditary nature of the presidency where you can aspire for your son or nephew or faction friend to be elected after you, but you have to really entrench separately from government rather than entrenching the government and trusting that the government will pass to your successor directly. Uh, that, that sort of hybridizing those comparisons and bringing the papal one in. How do you get your family powerful enough to hope to have another election choose you in the next generation is a different question from how do you try to entrench as an emperor who has no term limit. Um. Aquatic geochemist, Rachel Coit, you get the last question. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, what are the big areas of contention in your field? Like, what do people argue over? Are there things that people stand up at conferences and yell at each other about, or? This is a great question. They take uh, these sticks and they wrap them in a two-headed ax and they just chase each other around the room. <laughs> yeah, both of you, g give a sense of like what's in, in your field right now. When you go to a conference, what is the subject that's going to have everybody spitting at each other? I think Ada and I might have very similar answers. Uh, and it is talking about multiculturalism and diversity in the ancient world, and also the fact that classics is the whitest discipline in the American Academy. So we have less than 1% um, are, are African Americans, and uh, probably in the area of three, maybe 4% um, are people of color in, in total. And so we are having a, a lot of debates about white supremacy and the use of classics uh, by by people like uh, Identity Europa, for instance, and and by various other um, individuals like Trump and, and 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 political people like Steve King that we talked about earlier, and that really comes out at conferences because there are just huge debates over whether classics is quote unquote neutral, um, and neutrality is a stance. You know that from Switzerland. That is still a position that you take, um, and it's a position of cowardice. So that's what we yell about. Um, Ada, what are you guys yelling about? Does it have to do with Anglo-Saxons? Uh, I mean, Anglo-Saxons to some extent, yes, but the Middle Ages are much more fraught with that than Renaissance. Uh, so a lot of Renaissance conferences is talking about how relieved we are that things are less tense than they are at the medieval conferences, and for those who attend both. <laughs> You know, stories about how it's really, really bad. It's really, really bad because there's a ferocious presence within both medieval studies and classical studies that doesn't want to admit that there is a problem, that doesn't want to admit that these histories are being co-opted by uh, problematic groups. And we'll say, you know, the Crusades aren't being used by white supremacists. And you show them photos of Charlottesville neo-Nazis with Templar outfits and Templar symbols on their stuff. And they'll still say, no, 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 they're not invoking the Crusades. They're invoking a video game that's invoking the Crusades. And you know, uh, I had a uh, friend, David M. Perry, who I think you've had on the show. I love David. Yeah, David. David, yeah. You know, who he and a friend were working on a, a collection of essays about uh, middly, medieval stuff being co-opted by white supremacy and how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And and 
had trouble with the press because half of the reviewers said, oh, this is a great book. It's so needed. This is the biggest issue in our field. And the other half of the reviewers said, there's no white supremacy in medieval stuff. What are they talking about? This book is pointless and making up a tension where there isn't one. And that is part of the tension itself is that there's the the camp that is neither actively white supremacist nor battling white supremacy, but sort of denying that it's there. Um, so the you know this line of questioning makes me think of I often have friends who have kids in middle school who are choosing what languages to study in high school ask me do you think I should have my kids study Latin and I always say there are three good reasons and two bad reasons to study Latin uh, you can have your kids study Latin because the Latin classroom will usually attract the nerdiest kids and the kids who are most enthusiastic about their studies and is likely to give your kid a peer group where people think that being enthusiastic about learning is good instead of uh, bullying it. Uh, and that's a good reason to study Latin. Uh, studying Latin will give you access to a vast and long literary tradition and learn, teach you to think about reception and how things are received over time. In that sense, it is co-equal with studying other great literary traditions, such as classical Chinese literature or classical Arabic literature. Um, and it'll also uh, open the doors to doing research in primary sources in that field, co-equally with any other language that has a cool body of primary sources that it opens up. But the, the two bad reasons, one is it improves your SAT scores, which is true, but problematic it is you know shows why the SATs are also bad and that they don't tend to test for aptitude for college as much as they test for uh, socioeconomic status of the family that sent this kid and whether there was Latin a or Latin not. class yeah. Yeah. right yeah. Uh, and the other is if you think that Latin is a superior and the most important literary tradition that would not say that it is co-equal with studying classical Chinese or co-equal with studying Arabic. And that's a vein of parent that shoves their kids into Latin as well. That is where these problems that Sarah and uh, David and others are working so hard to try to deal with is we need to keep studying these areas. We we are only now beginning to understand how wrong we've been for generations about many things. That's one of the exciting things about studying in a much studied area, right? And Renaissance studies too is just discovering the leagues of mistakes that we've said about earlier things, which Petrarch promised us we would for generations in his uh, dialogue about why uh, we have too many books um, and that we'll never finish reading them all and that they're full of mistakes are, and we'll never find them You guys are critical all. ancient scholars. You're <laughs> like, like, it's like, it is so refreshing to hear this because it's such a, it's such a way that I would have engaged so much more with these topics if they were taught by people that look like you and sound like you and just like talk about things critically in the way that you do. And it's just, it's been a really refreshing more than an hour to spend with you. Speaking of which, we need to leave it there. <laughs> um, uh, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. And Ada, thanks for popping in. Uh, yes, it was, uh, my pleasure. Uh, it's uh, been great talking with you both. Um, tomorrow, for a radical change of pace, we have uh, Mark, and I'm. I, I, he has a very long Greek name uh, that I cannot say without it in front of me. Uh, he is a longtime CIA officer who uh, has had major health complications from uh, these un, uh, unspecified uh, uh, incidents uh, that took place uh, perhaps at the hands of, of some foreign actor. Um, and he is coming on to talk about his uh, experience uh, in that regard. Polymeropolis. Uh, thank you, uh, Christopher, uh, Christopher, <laughs> uh, for uh, spelling it out for me. It's not that I have trouble pronouncing it; it's that I have trouble remembering all the Just, syllables. It's Plastic City. Come it on, is, Plastic oh City. God, Polymeropolis. So it is yeah. awesome. Whoa. Um, <laughs> um, uh, all right. Um, uh, that will be twenty-two hours and uh, uh, forty-six. 46 minutes from now. Uh, sorry, after a little bit of bourbon, the, uh, the math goes away. And until then, 
we don't have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, we will always have Rome. See you guys <laughs> later. Salute. Bye, Bye Sarah. Bye, Adrian.